on two wheels this week. More chat from Jeff and round the world biker Nick Sanders. We'll be taking a closer look at the triumph that he used. And we'll meet Wayne Booth, a teacher from Lancaster who aims to ride non-stop from John O'Groats to Land's End. But first, here's Wayne on a road test. Well, they've done it to me again. As most of you know, I have dreams about something bigger. In the way of a motorcycle, I might add. And my dream has not come true. Look, they've given me this. A Yamaha Tios 125. Although I might add, it is actually quite big. Big in respect to height. It's quite tall, look. I can only just touch the floor on my tiptoes. But nonetheless, it is a bike to ride, isn't it, eh? So let's see how this little baby performs. Let's burn some rubber. Yeah! Burning rubber, uh, I don't think so. But having said that, this is a nice little 125 machine. Yamaha call it the XN125, but we know it as the Tios. And the Tios is a 124ccs of four-stroke liquid-cooled engine. As it is only 123 kilograms, and with my slight of weight on it, because I'm only a small chappy, then obviously it carries along at quite a sensible speed. In fact, it does around 60, 65 mile an hour quite comfortably. Only the other day I was on a dual carriageway and I had to come up to a great big steep hill going over a bridge. It got to the top just as easy as it went down the other side. And another important thing is its overall size. It's actually quite a big machine. You have quite a presence on the road. Car drivers do in fact take note of your existence, which is quite a nice item when it comes to safety. Now this size thing, it is a problem. It's a particular problem for me because I've been vertically challenged all my life. But that's not uncommon. There is more folk out there just like me. In particular, perhaps the ladies who could indeed be the customer for a bike like this. What's the problem, you might ask? Well, here we go. Very simple. It's the overall height of these things. Even though they're a little scooter, they're very, very tall. And indeed, the seat is very, very comfy, but very wide. This makes it a problem. No, okay, it's on the stand at the moment, but knock it off the stand, and it's still a problem. A lot of people do like to put the foot firmly on the ground. Now, I can do so with one foot, but not with both either side. And there's another thing as well. It's only got a main stand. And why do they only put a main stand on? Because again, that could deter people from buying a bike like this. All right, gripe's over now. No more complaining. It's actually a smashing little machine, this. It's a 125 four-stroke engine, water-cooled. Therefore, up front here, we have a radiator and like a fan to keep it cool, because obviously a machine like this will be sold all over the world, hot climates and cold climates. Its overall style, I think, is absolutely beautiful. It's very classic, very retro -y. In fact, it reminds me of an all-time favourite of mine, and that is the Vespa ET4. The ET4 is again a 125 four-stroke engine. They do an ET2 Vespa, and that is a 50cc two-stroke. This, I think, has got good looks, good style, and it's very, very practical. Something I did note, and some clever guys out there might, in fact, know it as well, and that is, such as the ET4, is a metal unit and on this one it's plastic who gives a hoot what it's made out of it could be made of wood for all i care i think scoops are ideal they're a marvelous thing they get you around and about economically i mean this little baby will probably do a zillion miles to the gallon it almost certainly will do double the average car which is great on economics and because it's a four stroke engine of course you don't need the expense of two stroke oil either so it's damn good value for money in fact, the list price on this model is less than two and a half thousand pounds. And when you add the extras such as insurance and road tax on it, it isn't going to break the bank. In fact, listen, road tax, it's only 15 quid on a 125 nowadays. Even I can afford that. I'll tell you what I want to do. I just want to remind you out there, for those of you who are not regular motorcycle users or scooter users, how easy it is, the basic fundamentals of riding a little scooter like this. So, start with the basics, going forward, for example. Well, normally on a push bike, you pedal. But on one of these, it's real lazy because you just turn the throttle, the accelerator, and away you go. To stop, couldn't be any simpler, just like a push bike. 
you pull that lever on the right hand side and that activates the front brake, pull the one on the left hand side and that activates the back brake. Couldn't be any simpler. It's full of all sorts of safety features as well. Such as, for example, when you come to start the bike, which is an electric start, you press a button and it starts, no swinging on a kickstart. When you come to start the bike, you can't do so unless you've actually applied one of the brake levers. So it won't go shooting off on you, no fear there. There's no petrol to turn on and dirty your hands with an oily petrol switch. There's not even any choke to activate. It's automatic on most of them, not on all. On the dashboard, all sorts of indicators for you to know whether you've got your high beam on, your low beam on, whether you've got your indicators flashing and everything. So it really, really is an easy thing to ride. And let's remember, they do them from right down 50cc, which are restricted to 30 mile an hour, right up to some big ones nowadays, 400 and 500cc, which will carry along the road at around 100 mile an hour. So scooters, there are loads of different types. So don't be frightened of these things. This, you know, you, what you should do now is go down to your local dealer and have a try, because you never know, this could be the start of a two-wheel relationship. It could end up with things getting a bit bigger and ended up with a super bike in the family. Anyway, you must forgive me now, I've got very important things to do. I've got a communication thing to carry out. Hello, this is the bridge, is that the engine room? Now put the kettle on, I'm coming down. <laughs> Now if you've been watching over the last few weeks, you'll know that I've been road testing various different types of scooters. If you haven't been watching, I want to know why. One of the scooters we first did was that little slider, the 50cc. Then we did the 100cc Aerox two-stroke, and then we did this, the Teos, a 125 four-strokes. Three entirely different types of scooters. One that was a little thing that was bare, naked, had no leg shield, didn't know what it was, a scooter or even a street fighter. Then the Aerox, which is very stylish, that's just like a space age machine right into the 21st century. Then this, which is more like a retro, a classic line, entirely different. In fact, all about different, there is every different type, style and size of machine you could ever want. It's horses for courses, don't ask me which I prefer. And talking of size, I'm just curious to know, does my bum look big in these pants? It's the padding, you know, it's the body armour. Now bikers doing their bit for charity, nothing new there then is there? People are raising money for all sorts of different organisations all over the place. But I want to introduce you to a man who's taken on what I think is a rather ambitious project. This is him, Wayne Booth. So tell me what it is exactly that you're attempting to do, Wayne. Well I'm planning to ride from John O'Groats to Land's End. Well there's nothing special in that in itself, riding from John O'Groats to Land's End. Lots of people have done that in the past, but what makes your task a little bit more difficult? I intend to do it without stopping at all. At all? At all. Right, OK. That prompts me to ask the obvious question. What happens at traffic lights and road junctions and things like that? Well, the idea is just to have uh, support vehicles with us and uh, they help us progress through the roundabouts. Right. And uh, I've done a little bit of research to make sure we know how long traffic lights stay red at certain uh, junctions. This is the bike you're using. For what, 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 is, what is it you're using? It's uh, an Africa Twin. Uh, a 650, right. and it's an ex Parry Dakar rally bike. Right. What about petrol? Uh, well, normally this takes 38 litres in the front, and it has a rear tank which takes 28 litres, but we're having a new rear tank made to bring the total up to 100 litres. Wow, that's a lot of fuel. That's also a lot of weight. Is that going to be a problem? It will be, certainly starting off and coming through Scotland at first, yeah. it will be a bit top heavy. Oh, I've right. got to be very careful there. Well, obviously the weight will, will improve as you're going on, as you start using up the fuel, yeah. As a ride down, yes. How long is it going to take you, do you think? Um, about 15 hours, right. give or take a, um, half an hour or so. And, I can't uh, stay awake for 15 hours, never mind ride a bike for No, no, hours. it's not going to be too easy. I've, I've done quite a few long distance rides before, and I'm preparing myself with a, a personal trainer, who is not only getting me fit uh, <laughs> physically, but also mentally. Right, I mean, I know you're going to eat or drink while you're on this? Yes, I obviously can't have any sandwiches along the way. No. And, or a cigarette, but uh, I do intend to... Um, you're going to drink? you have to drink yeah, fluids? Drink. I'm going to have a, a pack on the back and drinks around me, and I have to drink through straws. Which leads me to another question. 15 or 16 hours on the bike, taking fluids, 
you might want to answer the call of nature now and again. What yes. are you going to do? Well, for that, I've got to wear what's called a, a Uri sheath, which right. is a pipe, basically, and uh, which will empty out on the mm. end of my boot. God, I hope I'm not behind you when that happens, <laughs> dearly me. Have you done anything like this before? Because it's a hell of a task, that. Um, I have ridden from uh, North Africa to England uh, non-stop once, except for fuel. That's I was more than 900 fuel. miles, isn't it? That, that is, yes. <laughs> I did manage to stop a couple of times for a break and have a, a cup of coffee. That right. was after an expedition I'd done down there. Right. Yeah. And are you into trail riding? Is that why you have a bike? This is your own machine, isn't it? <clears throat> yes, I use this every day and uh, to and from work and I also trail it quite yeah. often too. Yes, yeah, so it's a bit heavy, heavier than uh, some of the bikes I go with, but right. I, I ride with a big trail bike club, which and this is quite a small engined uh, bike compared to some of theirs. Right. Well, it prompts the obvious question then, Wayne. Why on earth are you attempting this? Well, I intend to raise some money for the National Tri Childbirth Trust and also the Macmillan Nurses. Oh, right. Right, good stuff. So you're aiming to do this non-stop, right, which is a task in itself, but there's, you've set yourself another little target as well that, that you're going to try and stick to. What's that? Yeah, it's not just non-stop, but completely non-stop with no feet down without the wheel stopping. Right. All the way. Are you a bit of a trails rider on the quiet? Can you balance like the Dougie Lampkins of this world? Uh, not on this bike, no. I think I'd have a problem with this. <laughs> it's a bit too heavy. And just one other thing I've got to ask you is, is this young chap here, who you Henry. might have noticed, Henry the dog. You're yeah. famous for taking Henry around on your bike, I believe. That's true. Henry, up, go on, what's this? Up here. Up, go on, up. Look, he's broke the seat now. <laughs> but he, he, he travel, does he travel around with you on the bike? He does, yes. He, he comes on the back. I have a cage on the back. <laughs> and um, it's been checked out by the police as, as legal. And some vets gave me some advice on the size to make the little cage. So ah. he's quite safe on the back. I was going to ask you about the legalities. Is, so he's not classed as, he classed as a pillion rider? No, he's classed as a... Um, I remember in a minute. Is it livestock the classic dog has? Yes, he classed as livestock, yes. <laughs> so he's all right, as long as he's, he's all right. Yes, that, that's true. Yeah, they, the police checked it out to check that he was OK. <laughs> and um, and he's, he's quite happy on the back. I I've even done a, uh, a, a police ride and they, they assessed my driving all and right. my riding on the bike. And I took Henry with me. Yeah. And uh, they, they were that impressed at how good a pillion rider he was, they actually gave him his own certificate. <laughs> Fantastic, love it. Right, I presume he's not going to land then with you? No, I think it'd be a bit unfair uh, asking him to stay on the back for 15 hours, actually. Right, yeah. right. All right, well, I wish you all the very, very best. And uh, what, a couple of weeks off now, are we? Yeah, Yeah, a couple of weeks' time, yeah. yeah. 17th and 18th of April. Right, well, Thank uh, you. Well, well, good luck and let us know how you go on. Thanks very much indeed. Cheers. Cheers. And still on the theme of spending long hours in the saddle, coming up after the break, Jeff chats with the fastest biker around the world, Nick Sanders. Nick, one of the things that I mentioned in my introduction, the mileages that you do. Now, I go on a fairly regular trip down to the south of France, that's about 640 miles, which I do in a day, and I know that is a long way you know in this long time but you do this day in day out don't you what's the most you've ever done in a day well 600 miles is a great mileage you yeah. know and when riders come up to me and say six or seven hundred miles it's very hard to do you yeah know? i think it's all credit to them but um the longest mileage i did i was regularly doing 1200 miles when i was in training going yeah. up to stockholm and back in the day or not well one day there yeah. and one day back and Geneva and so forth there and back. Um, on the record ride, I came back from Lisbon to Calais in 23 hours, and that was 1,521 miles. Um, and that was in the last day. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, you know, when you're used to cycling around the world, and you're doing, say, 171 <laughs> miles a day. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. like, everyone does it, yeah. <laughs> then, you know, you are used to a degree of pain. Yeah. And, uh, and it does hurt. It hurts me a great deal. Yeah. I mean, anyone could do this. It, it's all a question of how much pain... You, you're being modest there, ..do they want to take, you know. But the, the, the practicalities of just sleep and whatnot, when do you grab... Or don't you, are you someone who doesn't need a lot of sleep? No, I need a lot of sleep, yeah. but, um, you know, yes, I like no, these my... two don't quite go together, but, I no. mean, what do you do? Do you catnap or what? No, I love my kip, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah catnap, power nap, call it yeah. what you like. Right. And I'll say, I, I learned this on when I was training again, going across Europe. I did 60,000 miles in training, and I suddenly developed something, you know, where I'd sleep on the bike. Yeah. And it's like method acting. Not actually you, while I'm riding. You didn't hear that, folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not while you're riding. Oh, right, Although, then. literally, though, I did actually fall asleep on a, you know, on a number of occasions. Just and then uh, wake uh, up. Uh, We've uh, all uh, done uh, that. Uh, yeah. It's quite scary. 
Um, at that point, I'll stop. I'll sleep on the bike for, say, 15 minutes, but no longer. Yeah. And then come up, and I'm really you refreshed. You just stretch yourself out along the bike. Yeah. yeah. It, again, when I say it's like... like some girly calendar thing. Yeah, yeah, sort of, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like... Um, but without getting off the bike, because you've got to feel part of it, part of the whole thing. It's yeah. a hard thing to explain, really. It's, it's almost a way of thinking, a way of being. Yeah. As anything, really, I guess. You want to keep yourself tied to the bike. That's really. it. Yeah. Exactly that. Yeah. You know. And as soon as you dissociate yourself from the bike, you're going to have a long kip, and you're not going to wake up. So how about the, the old eating thing? I mean, assuming you don't take speed or anything like that, but I mean, enhancing substances. But if you, um, do you have a sort of, is it glucose or do you stop for a meal? I can't see how you can. Well, if you took performance enhancing sort of stimulants, you'd find, I think, after a while, um, that, um, you, you know, there'd be a backup and a build-up. And you'd, you know, you'd be okay for a few days, but after a while, you'd just have to sleep for two or three days to catch up. Yeah. I, I'm sure that wouldn't work. It was very natural the way I did it, actually, um, and based on, on sleeping well, living well, yeah. being well. You know, there's a whole number yeah. of things, training well, yeah. eating well beforehand, um, and eating as little as possible whilst you're actually doing yeah. the record attempt. Yeah. You don't want to be bloated okay. and full of, you know, pork chops or stuff no, like that. Right. You want to just feel light, you know, free, frisky, get out there, do it, and then get home as fast as I could. I mean, I had a very simple agenda, going around the world as quickly as I could, and then come back and then carry on with my life as normal. You know? Yeah. And so, and you make it all sound so very normal, but again, I've been in hot climates and you get dehydrated, so you keep your fluid levels up. I mean, that's so important, isn't it, on these long runs? You've to got to drink, drink all the time, yeah, yeah. you bet. Yeah. And, you know, even if nothing else. Yeah. Well, that's the things about you. I'd also like to have a look at your um, your bike, especially the Daytona. Have you, have you got all, all your bike? You've got the Enfield as well. The you? Enfield's not here, it's actually somewhere else, but I, you know, yeah. I own the Enfield and, I'm, and I've got the mobile got bike. Got a self-lock for that. Oh, you bet, absolutely. Well, let's yeah. go and have a look at your bike. I've got some questions I'd like to ask Fine. about that. Fine, I'd love to show you. Excellent. Nick, I can't believe just how standard this bike is. I was expecting to see little gizmos screwed on somewhere and a spare water tank, oil, fuel or whatever, and somewhere to stick spare tyres, but there's none of that. This really is the bike. Yes. You're it's telling the truth. Absolutely. This, this, this. I swear. <laughs> no, there's no customization of the whole thing, you know. Jeff. No. I probably I was very naive early on. Because I was, you know, I just bash forward and just go for it. So I didn't have anything um, special about it at all. And there's no panniers that you got what, what do you have just a tail pack and a tank bag and that's it yeah i think i did have panniers actually um a small set yes. but i only carry the bare minimum mm -hmm. i mean i didn't even actually carry a spare set of clothes right. you know i kind of took my leathers off oh, right. and, uh, yes. yeah so what did you carry with you what did you class as the essentials you know money and credit cards <laughs> yeah that sort of thing passport yeah. you know toothbrush toothpaste stuff like that um, yeah. um i had a whole load of telephone sockets as well for kind of different countries but you know because right. we obviously email and stuff. Oh, I mean, right. you know, one of my sponsors was, was an IT company and and we'd send email attachments and voice attachments and stuff every night. This is one of the things that slowed the journey down because I had to spend about three or four hours a night writing the story, sending it as an email attachment and, and, uh, and then, you know, then trying to get, get a bit quite, of kip. Yeah, quite a job that is, just on its own. But look, with the bike as standard as it is, you're doing a hell of a lot of miles. What was it? Was it 19, 20,000 miles in, in round figures or whatever on your well, round the world thing? I got it wrong, you see. Yeah. You only need to do 18,000 miles. Right. But I, I couldn't count or something. So I did 19,930 miles. So it's nearly 2,000 miles more than I should have done. Right. Well, so you, well, you could knock a couple of days off straight away, you know. You, but, you um, certainly could. But what I was going to get at is within that, the servicing to be done. And I mean, normally people might be a bit sloppy, but the Triumph is, what, 6,000 miles service, I suppose. So what was happening about oil changes? Oh, it's really cool. I mean, Triumph are very good about that. They've got yeah. a good network around the world. And, you know, obviously I, I had a service situation in Istanbul. Yeah. The next one was in Perth, Australia. Right. Sounds a long way away, but it's only, you know, it's less than 6,000 miles, miles, funny enough. Yeah. The next one was um, in San Antonio oh, right. in, um, in, uh, in, te in, uh, in Texas. Yes. And, um, and then the next one, well, I didn't need one to come. But uh, we, we see, I also did a practice journey, which um, from Tierra del Fuego yeah. up to uh, Alaska, yeah. which went through Tierra del Fuego, Patagonia, Chile, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Peru, <laughs> Ecuador. Wait, these practices, right? Yeah. Uh, Guatemala, Honduras, yeah. Nicaragua. On, yeah. went on and on and on. And I had to miss the service situation there in Mexico City because Mexico is so big. Yeah. It would have taken me eight hours to get into it's the heart of Mexico and then eight hours to get right, out. Right. So I just missed. And my chain was really slack in the Atacama. Yeah. So I had to basically um, get to, again to San Antonio oh, yeah. on the way back up to Al so Alaska. So did you have to do anything yourself? I mean, did you adjust things like the chain? And did the old, we're all there with the aerosol spray, spraying the chain up every year. Uh, well, they recommend sort of 300 miles and I, I can't see you doing that really. Well, you know, I mean, the, 
I had a Scott oiler, so oh, that right, yeah. worked very well, you yeah. know, and it did really save me maybe, I mean, if you've got to spray a chain, you know, for six or 800 or 1,000 miles a day, you're spraying it three times a day, yeah. three times 20 you, minutes, you lose an hour. You need so, a trailer full of aerosols as well. You? Exactly, so, you know, the oiler, the Scott oiler worked very yeah. well for me. I think that was the only specialist bit of kit I had yeah. on the bike, to be honest. And, and, and tyre-wise, what, what did you do for tyres? Well, I don't know, I think um, I had battle axes for yeah. quite a while. I had tyres with a hard compound in the middle, right. you know, and soft on the edges. Yeah. Um, but I rode really well. I mean, you don't exactly race away at lights when you cross in India, <laughs> you know. So um, I managed to get 8,000 miles out of my tyres. So I'd get them down to the core, obviously, yeah, yeah. and then change. And I didn't have any punctures. Oh, fantastic. And so the bike just held together as it was then. You know, reliability is testimony to reliability then, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it's the ultimate reliability test for any bike to yeah. go around the world, yeah. let's face it. But I suspect um, it's also to do with how you ride it. I, I rode very gently. Mm -hmm. I am not a very macho rider. There yeah. are, in fact, even though it's the fastest man around the world, that's exactly what I am. Yeah. I'm not the fastest biker could, yeah. in and the world. There's a subtle difference. There is a big two. difference yeah. between that, Jeff, you know. And, um, you know, I'm very, it's like being in the Wild West. People like to take you on because you're the fastest biker and stuff. Well, there are lots of bikers much faster than me, much more able yes, as well, yeah. you know. But what I can do is I can do it again and again and again and again. And I can do it in Malaysia or India or Thailand or Singapore or wherever you like, and I'm still quick. Yeah. And, I'm st and, I, and it's dodging the traffic. You see yes. the trucks in India, you oh, know, it's yeah, horrendous. I know I saw and, some of your footage. But the bike, just thinking of that and accidents that I know you came across, which really seems to sort of affect you, I remember you, you saying that, but you didn't have any on the bike, did you? You didn't even no. drop it, did you? No, 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 no nothing at all. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like the whole project was like a Formula One sort of situation whereby if any one component went down, which you couldn't repair, that was it. The project was over. Yeah. You know, you just fly the whole damn bike back and, and then maybe start again at a later stage. So it had to be a 100% perfect project. Well, if the exploits of Nick Sanders has inspired you to jump on your machine and cover thousands of miles, stay tuned next week when Nick will be telling us about his latest venture, a round-the-world race with teams of bikers. Also on Two Wheels next week, Wayne and I have lots of fun at an exhaust factory. We'll discover how a race cam is put together. <laughs>